Hey guys, welcome to The Value Script. Today we're going to continue to break down um, the five love languages. Um, we've started talking about that and today we're going to be talking about chapter seven, which is acts of service, which coincidentally I think is both of our love language. <laughs> so we kind of discovered that a little more as we dove into the book and um, talked about it and realized that that was specifically um, one that really resonates with both of us. So it was funny as as you were saying that I was thinking about when I was reading the book and it, and I had gotten through pretty much all of the book um, and even up to the point where in uh, the later chapters so our next episode that we're gonna do um, he breaks down and talks about what if you can't figure out what your love language is or what your wife's love language is and those chapters actually really helped me dive into it because what I was afraid of was the acts of service was your love language because yes. <laughs> was, but coincidentally i think it's mine too but right. the reason i was afraid of it is because i realized i wasn't doing enough i wasn't doing enough acts of service and if this is your love language i realized i was grossly missing things for you <laughs> and i felt bad and so it's interesting that as as we dive in here hopefully some of that will come out but i just thought that was quite ironic <laughs> that you know um i was thinking about that and and one of the things is like you know, talking about acts of service, like doing the dishes might be the sexiest thing you do for your wife if that's her love language. And, and you, you talk about that. Yeah. You actually had told me that, you know, and it wasn't like I had to wonder. Like you actually brought it up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is interesting. I don't know. It's good. I love stuff like this, especially this book is fantastic because it opens up conversation that you wouldn't necessarily normally have or even like to even think <laughs> to have. So I think it's fantastic if both spouses are willing to read it. Yeah, you know what I mean. It, it's all. It's also yes. not fantastic if you're the one trying to work on your marriage and your and your partner's like tone deaf to it, right? And, yeah, and, and maybe not even on hard. purpose. They're tone deaf to it, but they just. So you both are wanting to read it, right? Well, we're both yeah. wanting to figure out what our love languages are so that we can yeah. love each other better, yeah. rather than like I wonder what mine is, and then you don't feel loved because now you have this knowledge and information, but your spouse or your partner is not willing to reciprocate that same gesture. Yeah, right. it really is just about really the desire to be intentional about making our marriage better, because for years we didn't even recognize the problems that we did have until there was this catastrophe that happened and yeah. really Sanitizer. wrecked everything. And so yeah. we had to choose to put the pieces back together and to, you know, when he talks about that dive in. with I wasn't even planning on talking about the conversation that he has with this couple that was um, he was a. Uh, Worked in a mill, but um, as I read that story, it brought those things up to me. But one of the first things I like is, you know, on the on the second page of this chapter, um, the acts of service don't necessarily have to take a lot of time. Just depending on what they are and where your where your love language is and, and what you need. But like this husband always hated. <laughs> <laughs> Paisley just brought some hand sanitizer in for Justin. <laughs> well, I thought it was going to just gonna be like a little thing. <laughs> then it was like this giant, like two liter germ. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of us in this house. We yeah. get the economy size. <laughs> so, thank that was, you. That was awesome. All right, cut back to uh, the book. Um, one of the things this, this particular husband hated was when he got home every day, there was a pile of, of trash and cans for him on the, on the on the curb for him to take care of and so rather than like hey welcome home it was kind of like well here you go as soon as you get home here's, here's your, your task, job <laughs> right and i could relate to that whereas i don't know if you remember i was i was telling you one of the one of the best ways to make me feel unwelcome is to stack all the trash bags in front of the garage door because that's all i see when i first get home is hey, here's mm -hmm. the trash you get to take care of hey welcome home thanks for thanks for working hard for us by the way take out the trash which is which is kind of, okay, but you don't take out the trash. Brecken takes out the trash, and our dumpster is now it is away. not back not back when that was so. happening. Now, now oh, it is now okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> anyway, and, and then and then walking in the house and it's you know there was mass it was mass chaos right like I didn't realize it is one of my love languages that the acts of service that you do really flawlessly because I didn't necessarily realize it. I only realized when it wasn't done, right? Like when the house was a mess or the mail was piled up or, you know, like I didn't have, um, you know, a white shirt when I needed to go to the church back when that was the thing. Um, you know, when I was, when I was bishop, you know, I needed a white shirt every Wednesday and, and I didn't always have a white shirt. And so I was like, and, and I, so I felt unloved, you know, by not having, there were simple things that you didn't even know that I felt that way. For sure. Uh, yeah. For so, sure. Um, I, I just kind of thought that was... Uh, Is that one of those things where it's like you uh, you are looking 
for not not that you're looking for the negative but it's like it's what stands out sometimes well, i think it's because it is one of my love languages right and it just wasn't being met on the level yeah that yeah, yeah. It, that i felt and i didn't even know i wasn't aware of this but having like having the lack of meeting that need brought that need out for me gotcha right and, and, and really and that's why it's important to talk about this because she didn't even know i felt that way yeah and and to be honest when things were at their rockiest point for for us all that stood out was the negative right that's that is all that was seen like they're and and that's because we were in such a it's such prob- a bad spot. it's probably hard to see the positive of anything when you're in a moment like that well yeah and he you know he talks about a couple that was disintegrating similarly um there was a, a man that worked in a mill and he um you know he thought he did all the good stuff you know he thought he was supportive he was providing a living um he was i think they went on dates fairly regularly they did activities but um he always wanted to go hunting on sunday no matter what and she wanted him to go to church with her and as a family and he was like well I guess, you know, I guess I'll go, but I really just want to go hunting. Mm -hmm. He wasn't willing to see that. He's like, look, I do everything else great for you. How come this is such a big issue? And it was really just the act of the service of supporting her and doing that was what was lacking there. And even though he was buying roses and doing the other things, um, taking her on dates and, and um, she wanted help with putting her daughter to bed, putting their daughter to bed because that gave them more time to be together. And he Mm -hmm. didn't want to do that. You know, he didn't think it was necessary. She was doing it. And he was, you know, he did the manly stuff outside the home and she did the, the, the motherly roles inside the home. And she needed that to blur a little more <laughs> and, to, and, to, and to mesh a little better. And that, when I was reading through that, I started realizing like, oh. Was there a compromise though? Like, was he able to go hunting at all? Yeah. Or did he just yeah, give it up? Yeah, I don't remember well, how they worked that out. He but, didn't have to give it up. But, but. Once, once he began to be intentional about the things that she was asking for and needed, she got to the point, too, where she was like, okay, hunting is, okay is what it. he needs, too. Gotcha. Like, And she recognized that he's not hunting to try to escape or get away from me. That's something that he loves. And there was more of a balance there gotcha. where she could see that that was a need of his, but yeah. he was also being intentional about what she needed as well. So before when he wasn't balancing that out, it looked like hunting was just his thing. An escape. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. To get away from her. Yeah. And yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Book's um, really good. It's so good. You know what I love too on page 97? Um, it says no one likes to be forced to do anything. In fact, love is always free. Love is always freely given. Love cannot be demanded. When we request things of each other, but we can request things of each other, but we must never demand anything. Requests give direction to love, but demands stop the flow of love. So if you're constantly like nagging at your spouse, like we hear about nagging all the time, you know, nagging at your spouse to do this and this and this and this, like that, that just puts a negative slant to where your spouse doesn't want to do it because it just feels like, well, you don't appreciate all of these other things. You're just, you know, looking for the negative. But if you go to your spouse and say like, hey, this is something that I really need. It's something that's important to me. It's I feel like it's a way where we could connect better. And and I, I need this. That's a different approach to just, hey, <laughs> you're not doing this and I need you to do this. It's, it's presented well, I think, differently. I think too, nagging, stereotypically, has been um, assigned to, you know, the, the feminine role, the, the, the you know, the woman, oh, for sure. you know, the woman, the, nagging uh, the woman, wife. the woman's the nagging wife. Right. But I was a nagging husband for sure. I was a nagging husband because when I was upset, I was like, I would just go through the list. Like, for sure. this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. Yep. This is bad. Here's, this is a mess. And, yeah, it was, and, yeah. it, and I was, I was trying to like point it out because that was bothering me, but I was doing it in a way that made you have no desire to do it. Well, and yeah. I, to be honest, you weren't filling my cup at all. Like I wasn't getting anything positive. I felt like I was giving like during that time, during the time, this has not been our whole marriage, but during that time that was so hard, the last four years was very difficult to have a good relationship that was equally beneficial. Sorry. 
it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's just, it's real. I don't know. It is real. But that's where my favorite statement in this whole book is love is a choice. Because sometimes mm-hmm. you don't feel like loving your spouse. And sometimes you don't feel like the acts of service. And you don't feel like giving them what they need. But you choose to do it because you love them. And when you make that choice, that conscious choice, doesn't matter what you're going through, it's going to make it better every time, every time. And and even if you get to the point where you realize things aren't going to reconcile and you're not going to be able to stay together, I think still choosing to love allows you to work together to co-parent or to be friends or to not be hostile or you know all the typical things that come with divorce you can get through that and be on good terms if you choose to love that person anyway yeah really you need to be if you can't move forward in love that's a bad thing for your kids right because they're still going to be your kids the rest of your life Mm -hmm. that that person's still going to be their parent the rest of their lives and and um you don't need to run their name through the mud or drag the, ruin the reputation in your kids' eyes because it's very damaging for them, mm-hmm. even if you want to. And it's just a selfish act. So I think that's a really good thing that you brought up. And one thing that always puzzled me about divorce was when our friends would go through that and then all of a sudden these two people that loved each other their whole lives are sudden mortal enemies. Right. Like, how does that feel so to me. hard? Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. uh, like, did we ever really love each other? I mean, really, like... Like, you know what I mean? Like, how could you go from like, we're totally in love and married to, and you don't, it doesn't just, you don't flip a switch. It happens over time. But at one point you chose this person. Mm -hmm. There are reasons why you chose this person and you need to love yourselves through the entire thing. And if, if you realize you can't be together somehow, you need to lovingly keep it together for those that didn't make those choices. Like your kids, your Mm -hmm. kids didn't make the choice to to be in this family necessarily you made that for them so you need to carry that forward still and not give up on them as hard as that can be and we you know we didn't go full circle there i don't necessarily know going completely through a divorce but we we knocked on the door to that thing oh yeah yeah i i feel like we got as close to that as was possible without you know falling off the cliff but we did reach a point we've said this before but i think it's important to say i did reach a point to where i thought I need to love Meredith to the point where even if we don't work out, we help each other out. Like if our marriage doesn't work out, we still help each other through the processes. We don't just abandon each other and start throwing weapons at each other. We, you know, uh, emotional weapons, you know, not, not knives and guns. (laughs) Don't do that either. (laughs) It's not recommended. (laughs) But, um, I, I think, you know, one thing that we're kind of hinting about, but it talks about here on page 100, and it's, it talks about before, before you get married, how people act before you're married is really not an indication of how your marriage is going to go. Because before you're married, you're in that in love, like just that in love, passionate, you're really not. Like even before the honeymoon phase, you're in like the... It's all the dopamine. I'm in love, man. Hitting like, your brain. This woman's my soulmate. Like, yeah. I'm in love. Just high in life. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then after, and that fades. It just does. Yeah. It just fades. There's, there's um, um, physiologic reasons for it. There's emotional reasons why it fades. And after that, you revert to being the people you were before you fell in love. And before that love magic phase happened, you revert back to the persons that you were. And so it's important to understand that your perception of what, like how you fell in love may not necessarily be reality of what your love is. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to dig in and understand what does it mean to love your spouse? What does it mean for your spouse to be loved? And if you're missing those things like we were, um, you're, it doesn't, I mean, we had a good marriage and a good relationship, but it's still, we were still headed for a cliff. Have Huh? You have. Oh, I'm just saying before. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Thanks for the correction. We did. I'm talking about before the problem, <laughs> but before before the four year four year midlife crisis, right? Like, yeah, we we had a good a great as good a marriage as I even could have thought of, mm-hmm. but we still weren't necessarily meeting each other's needs. That's real, yeah. you know, and it's really um, I don't know. One of the greatest things I wish, or just looking back, that uh, the knowledge that I wish I would have known is it would be great. In the beginning of your marriage, if you're a newlywed couple, go in for some counseling sessions, like just to see where you are, just to make, see where your goals are, see if you're aligning, see if there's something that you're missing. And that like, not like you have to have counseling throughout your entire marriage, but I think those marriage tune-ups five years down the road, 10 years down the road, like I really think that would be good preventative 
Prevent maintenance. maintenance on your marriage. Maintenance on your marriage. <laughs> yeah, because because right. we didn't know what we didn't it's know. It's like getting an oil change in your car. All right. You know? And you know, and honestly, had we, you know, and I don't know how we would have taken this if we'd have read this book prior, mm-hmm. how it would have impacted us. But I know it certainly has a much more dramatic impact now. For sure. For us, because yeah. going through what we did, now being committed to not letting that happen again and loving each other through this, it's important to know these things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Is that still uh, chapter seven? That is still chapter yeah. seven. Um, just goes through um, some ideas for acts of service if that's your spouse's love language. And number three says, ask your spouse to make a list of 10 things he or she would like for you to do during the next month. Then ask your spouse to prioritize those by numbering them one through 10. Um, it seems like it might be kind of a cheesy thing to do, but for me, that totally resonated because I don't like, hi, (laughs) um, I don't like asking you to do things. I don't know why, but, but it really is. It's not like I ask you to do something and then you don't do it. Like I, I don't know why, but it is hard for me to be like, Hey babe, can you blah, 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 whatever. So but it's nice when it's done. So for me, that was one thing that was like, oh, that's a non-threatening, good way to for you to let your spouse know what you would like or what you need. Especially if you're both doing it. Right. Might be one right. thing to you drop a drop a ten ten item list on a spouse and be like, hey, right, figure this out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. right. I, I think you definitely need to do that together. <laughs> he talks about this again. This will be a future episode, but. Um, he does talk about, hold on. Here, okay. We need, we need to time out. Yeah, no, we're good. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm so glad that picked up on the mic. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. Please don't. I'm hungry. Please don't put that on there. <laughs> His hair's not combed. We don't want to look like an orphan. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> But you did want to hit on that page, you said? Yeah, it just, acts of service doesn't necessarily have to be rocket science. And it doesn't have to be, it can be, you don't have to do significant acts all the time. It could be something simple like taking out the trash or like last night I rinsed the dishes and helped unload the dishwasher. Not like I need a medal for it, but. But it was so nice. Uh, and it wasn't even okay. that big a deal, right? But Look at, look at the reaction. Was, no, really. It was so nice because we were shooting the podcast today and I wanted to not be stressed in the morning and trying to clean up the kitchen. So it was nice to have the kitchen clean before we went to bed and we were able i was you know we both were able to go to bed sooner because we do go to bed together somehow i was able to display my manly strength by when i went to pick up a plate i picked up the entire bottom tray of the dishwasher in one full swoop and she saw it and i didn't even have to like i didn't have to be like hey check out how cool this is i didn't know it was gonna happen it was just kind of cool <laughs> so, so manly strength while we unload the dishwasher <laughs> yeah that's how you can display manly strength unload the dishwasher tommy scram don't give her the weight room thing you know where the weight room is? I'll check it out. Another thing, like number four, while your spouse is away, get the children to help you with some act of service for them. When they walk in the door, join the children and shouting, surprise, we love you. And then share your act of service. You know, or um, it says this can also work if your spouse is away for a long period of time, such as like a military deployment or a work trip. You can recruit the kids to help you create some act of service for them. Take a picture and send it to them. Um, over over um, Skype or FaceTime or whatever while they're gone to let them know that you're thinking of them and you're still serving them while they're not there, mm-hmm. and that helps you know them to stay helps helps you or the spouse that's still home to stay top of mind with the spouse that's away too. Yeah, and for helps sure. helps you stay focused on your relationship when sometimes when you're away that's that's dangerous and it, and if your mind doesn't stay in the right place it can lead to problems. If and then lastly if you request. Um, to your mate come across as nags or put downs try writing them in words that would be less offensive to them (laughs) share (laughs) share this revised wording with your spouse Uh, for example this is fine the yard always looks so nice and i really appreciate your work i'd love to thank you in advance for mowing the lawn this week before paul and amy go over (laughs) (laughs) that almost seems a little little manipulative but (laughs) where's the lawnmower i can't wait Your husband might even respond. Where's the lawnmower? (laughs) Probably won't. But again, it's important to communicate these things. And if it's hard to talk about it, it, sometimes it's less threatening to write it down. But make sure you write it down in a way that you'd want to read it yourself. And for sure. But I love the point that you brought up, too, of doing it together. Talking about it together and having it be something that you do together. So that it's, like you said, not just 
dropping the list on your spouse. Yeah. <laughs> okay. hey, Here you go. While you're watching that football game, here's a list of 10 things you're not doing. Right. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven. I thought this was kind of funny. He worded it like this. If you have more money than time, hire someone to do the acts of service that neither of you wants to do, such as yard work once a month or deep cleaning of your home. No, I love that. I, well, I really just thought do. it was funny. Like, if you have more money than time, yeah, we all have the same amount of time. Yeah. For sure. But if, but I think it's just the point of like, we're busy. Yeah. Like, you, like, to be honest, we live on 19 acres. You don't have the time to maintain 19 acres. Bre- you, Brecken, like, we really don't. We really don't. For it's okay. example, sorry, go ahead. No, well, no. We don't. Or, or we don't take the time. It's an opportunity cost sometimes. For like, sure. You know, it's an opportunity cost. If I can spend this time maintaining this or we can go to do a family activity or we can do that as a family activity and sometimes we do. Right. But you're right. There are times when we get things get out of control and, you know, we had the landscapers here this morning because it was a mess. Right. <laughs> That's a what I was just going to bring up. <laughs> yeah. Like, right. You know, we were talking about what time for the podcast. You were like, well, we got landscapers in here in the morning. So. Right. Yeah, and But I, I had to, and they don't always come. They don't come every month. But when it gets out of hand. And right, it's going to be a monster to get it back together. <laughs> I, I call my, I call our Norfolk, and he brings his crew out. One of the best landscaping crews They're in fantastic. Arizona. I swear they are fantastic. They're so good, so so efficient. And um, anyways, the the last thing I, th- I want to get to is run interference for your spouse during his or her favorite TV show or important sporting events. Take care of all the phone calls, kids' emergencies, and so on. And, and that can be a significant thing. Honestly, it can be. Like it may not seem like a big deal to you. But sometimes if I'm really like keyed into something, I don't want to be interrupted 40 times. No, I don't want to be selfish and have that be my object, my object every, because like you pointed out one time, I can find a football game to watch every day of the week. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're like, how are there sports on every day of the week? You know, I was like, well, there's Monday night football, there's Thursday night football, there's Saturday college ball, there's Sunday professional ball. And then you have all the uh, critiques and outtakes yeah. and highlight reels and <laughs> everything. You can't watch every game all, you know, in one day. So. Uh, yeah. You know, now, now that, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how much access we have to Everything. waste time, right? We have so much access for entertainment and wasting time. That does not need to be the object of your relationship. But sometimes, every but once really in a while. it's just being considerate. Yeah, if there's right? an important thing that you don't want to miss, it's nice if your spouse runs interference on that. Mm-hmm. Or if your spouse is trying to take a nap, like try to help the kids be quiet. And, and especially when you things. get time to take a nap these days, I, I try to protect that because you don't get that very often. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, I think this concludes a good wrap-up of Chapter 7. We're not going to jump into Chapter 8. We'll have to do that next time on The Value Script. Don't forget to clickety-click, like, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to tune in. We'll see you next time. Value Script.